Hello everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Debatable with our hosts Nina and Kyle. Today we're going to be talking about K-pop. I am Kyle, one of your co-hosts. I'm Nina, your other co-host. I kind of messed up the order there, but like, okay, let's keep going. Well, (laughs) K-pop, like this episode seems to be like a long time coming. K-pop has been very big in the debate world recently. Like, it's been big outside the debate world for almost a decade now, but really caught up in debate land only recently. Um, BTS last week didn't win the Grammys, but just a few months ago, we've had a regional tournament set a motion exactly about why the BTS should just boycott the Grammys altogether. So in a lot of cases, the debate world kind of preempts a lot of these issues, a lot of these controversies that come up. So this is the reason why, you know, after the Grammys, we thought it was very important to just straight up talk about K-pop. So we don't really know much about it, which is why we invited someone today. Yeah, so we invited Natra to talk about K-pop issues with us because I personally don't know anything and Kyle and I wanted to talk about K-pop with someone who can't stop talking about it. So Natra's here. She's a political science major who claims to to specialize in political violence and extremism. So I guess she's the perfect candidate to talk about K-pop and all the K-pop stands. So hi, Naj. Hello, welcome to the show. Yeah. Um, so I guess first things first, tell us a little bit about K-pop. Pretend we're uninitiated because Nina straight up doesn't know anything. Mm-hmm. My knowledge ends at around 2012 or 2013. Give us like the definition of K-pop, the history, etc. Okay, sure. Um, K-pop stands for Korean pop or popular music, but it's really a genre, multiple styles. So it's not just pop. So Although it became a worldwide phenomenon quite recently, it has four generations already. So we're in the fourth generation of K-pop. So the first generation started around two decades ago when SM Entertainment debuted H.O.T. and B.O.A. and other groups and artists from that generation. Then the second generation happened around the early 2000s. So when we talk about Super Junior, Girls Generation, Wonder Girls, and other groups during this period. So it's when K-pop started becoming popular in Asia. So it's no longer just in South Korea, but also in other parts of Asia. Then in the third generation of K-pop, the target audience became the world. So it became an international phenomenon. And groups from this generation include BTS, EXO, Red Velvet, TWICE, and BLACKPINK. So what sets these groups apart from the previous generations of K-pop is that their target audience are international audiences. So that's what makes them different. And then the fourth generation started last year. So if the groups debuted in 2020 and onward, so they're considered as part of the fourth generation. So what makes the fourth generation different from the previous generations is that K-pop is no longer based in South Korea. It became a global phenomenon already. So groups from this uh, generation include ESPA, which debuted recently and and has not been in the K-pop industry for even a year. So those are the four generations of K-pop. And it became a global phenomenon quite recently, but it's been around for more than two decades. So we know it's been around for quite some time. It's become super big all over the world. Like you really can't read any Twitter thread without it showing up one way or another, as I've learned the hard way trying to matter load online. So we've heard about it, but what does it mean to be a K-pop idol? Because we've heard a lot of stories about K-pop idols not being paid well, the process becoming too tedious or quite difficult, and other industry things that personally we don't really have a lot of context to as hosts. So being an idol, contrary to popular belief, it's not just about being a musician. So as an idol, you're expected to be able to sing, to rap, and to dance. But there's more than uh, like, but we're expecting more from them somehow. So they also participate in variety shows. Um, they also have sometimes reality shows. So they also have to act. So there are a lot of expectations from becoming an idol. That, and it's not just about being able to sing or dance well. Mm. So there are different ways to become an idol. Some audition for it. Others join Produce 101 or similar shows. So it's when 
many individuals who want to become a star participate in a show and in order to become part of a K-pop group that will debut, you have to win that competition through voting. But there have been issues recently about two editions of this show being rigged. So the producing directors admitted that they accepted bribes and the competition wasn't fair. So that's an issue that arises from other ways of becoming a K-pop idol. So aside from those two, some also become trainees in secret. Like some usually come from rich families and they are training under a certain agency in private. And then you're just going to be surprised when they suddenly debut. So there's a there's an ongoing controversy right now that being an idol is no longer accessible to a lot of people because many of the idols that they viewed recently come from rich families. So for example, in ESPA, they're connected to um, big names in SM Entertainment. So some are saying that they were only able to do to debut because of their connections. So that's like there are controversies when it comes to becoming an idol. Also, it can be a bit sketchy in South Korea, for example, when you have uh, individuals from different entertainment agencies waiting outside high schools and even bothering high school students in order to try to recruit them as possible trainees. Yeah, so yeah, there are different ways to become an idol and there are issues that arise from each of them. So, but once you become an idol, like once you pass, once you finished your training days, in a K-pop group, they serve different and sometimes multiple roles. So you have the main visual, who is seen as the most conventionally attractive member of certain groups. So for example, in the girl group Red Velvet, the main visual is Irene. Also, you have a main vocalist, which is whose strength is really singing. So for, like using the same example of Red Velvet, uh, we have Wendy as the main vocalist, and then you have Sogi as the main dancer. So other groups also have a main rapper. So there are really different roles that each idol plays, and it depends on what their strengths are. However, what your role in a group is kind of determines what you're going to like the, what you're going to do the opportunity uh, what, what your role in a group is influences the opportunities you get after so if you're the main visual you're usually the face of the group so you get more brand deals and endorsements or if you're the main vocalist then you get more lines in a song but conversely you also get treated differently depending on the role you have so, for example, if you're the main visual, you have to be really careful about your image in a way that other idols aren't. So, I guess that's what it means to be a K-pop idol in the K-pop industry. So, that's really interesting because there are some motions. For example, in UNSW 2021, you had a motion about preferring the life of the visual to the life of the main vocalist. So, that's some interesting context for that motion that like until just now I had no idea how to debate I didn't know the difference or what any of that entailed but speaking of roles you necessarily have to talk about them within the context of a group are there any differences between male k-pop groups and female k-pop groups yes there is um based on an interview I watched recently of Amber from the K-pop group FX, which disbanded already, she said that male groups have to appeal to a certain group of population. So you have to have a solid fan base. Doesn't have to be everyone, just need to have a certain group that would support everything that you do. Whereas if you're a female K-pop group, you need to have mass appeal. So it's about being able to make a lot of people support you and not just a certain demographic. Additionally, aside from the target audience test, they differ in terms of expectations. So some say there's a double standard in the K-pop industry, similar to double standards everywhere else, right? So um, female idols are expected to be very thin. It's less acceptable for them to gain weight, whereas for men, it's generally more acceptable to not be as concerned as your weight. So those are some of the differences between male K-pop groups and female K-pop groups. So you mentioned that the standards seem to be different for both groups and they're held to basically different degrees 
Why do you think that's the case? I'm not really sure why there are differences, but a possible explanation is it's what the fans want. So obviously, this is a generalization, but but some fans want male idols to be their future boyfriends. Like some people think that way, or as or yeah, as male as their future boyfriends, or some fans want them to be their role models. And I think that what the agencies and the K-pop groups are doing are just meeting what the fans want from them. Yeah, so I guess if there is a double standard that you see or like a difference in treatment between male and female groups, you can probably trace it back to the individual biases or gendered expectations that you find in just regular people, like actual fans. So whatever problems you see in yeah in how they're being treated that's because like people are biased in in this sort of way but i guess now we can move on to talking about the fans because speaking of fans we wanted to ask what it means to be part of the fandom because it seems like fandom culture in k-pop seems to be very different from like fandoms anywhere else i mean that's what we've been noticing and that's what people have been telling us and so we did some research before and i found a certain concept um in korean culture called wuri or uri where it just means we or us but it isn't just about you being part of a group it's also about the group being part of you so would you agree with that statement that You know, there's a sense of solidarity in the fandom that you just can't get anywhere else. And why do you think that is? I do agree that that exists. So, for example, what I find curious about uh, K-pop fandoms is that we call members of the K-pop group we are supporting as my members. Or, like, comparatively, members of K-pop groups call their fans as my fans. So, there's a sense of ownership or belongingness that's really there but personally i don't see it that way because sometimes it can go on like it can become really extreme when you think you have ownership over the lives of your k-pop idols so yeah it does exist but it does not always lead to good outcomes like additional reasons why k-pop fandoms are really tight is because of the concept of love so i attended a forum recently held by I attended a forum recently about fandom culture and I guess a possible explanation for why we're really willing to defend our favorite idols or why we feel as if an attack on them is an attack on us personally as well is because we love them. We can't really explain why we feel that way, but we just do. And this drives us to invest a lot of our time, a lot of our money and other resources in order to watch their videos on YouTube or in order to create fan-made content about them on social media. So I guess love, the concept of love can explain why the fandom is known, to, like why fandoms are known to be very strong in the K-pop industry. Another possible explanation is the concept of parasocial relationships. So it does not just apply to the K-pop world, also applies to Western entertainment industries. But I guess in the K-pop industry, it's when idols have lives on Instagram on, and other social networking sites where you feel as a fan as if your idols are really your friends. You really know them. Um, even when we're not really sure how they act behind the screen. So this leads people leads some people to really defend like, an idol even when they have been exposed to committing some wrongdoings because they really believe in the image that they have seen through these interviews, through lives, etc. And then lastly, what I also find interesting about K-pop fandoms, some fans don't just support an individual K-pop group, they also support an agency. So among like, the top three or the big three agencies in the K-pop industry are SM Entertainment, YG Entertainment, and JYP Entertainment. And many fans identify with a certain agency, which I don't think happens in 
other industries. So for example, like you can be part of the SM family or you can consider yourself as part of the JYP nation. So and so yeah, that's something that happens in the K-pop fandoms. So when and I guess the reason why that happens is imagine if you're a fan of two K-pop groups that are under the same agency. It feels like it you like there's a sense of happiness that you can feel when you see them interacting on the same stage. So for example, in my case, I bo- I like both Red Velvet and EXO. And when you and when I see fan-made content about interactions between EXO members and Red Velvet members, you just feel as if you're all connected. So that you're part of the that you're part of a family. So I guess those three um explanation those are three possible explanations aside from the concept of uri that can explain why k-pop fandoms are the way they are so i guess we can move on to one of the bigger issues surrounding the k-pop industry or k-pop in general which is accountability so there have been cases where idols do some problematic things like you mentioned like probably they bully fans or staff members or maybe have engaged in activities that people don't find acceptable in society. How is the community reacting to those particular cases? Uh, I think the community is split. So, for example, Irene, the leader of Red Velvet, was recently involved in a scandal where a stylist said that she she shouted at her for about 20 minutes. So Irene already apologized to the stylist in private, also already apologized twice in public, and took a break from her activities in Red Velvet. However, some say that that's not enough, and they still want to continue punishing her for what she did. On the other hand, there are also some fans who say that the allegations were false, even when Irene already admitted to them and apologized because of them. There are some fans who are just saying that the stylist made it up in order to ruin the image of Red Velvet. So we're not really sure like where the community stands when reacting to these cases. So aside from canceling her completely or like exonerating her also completely, there are some issues that the K-pop world does not really talk about. So there are some members of K-pop groups who are accused of making racist comments in the past or for imitating like how people of color speak. However, in these issues, the community is largely silent. But when we talk about some relatively shallow issues, such as the dating statuses of their members, they become really angry. So yeah, so I think the community is really split when it comes to these cases. Yeah, I remember we talked about something like that in our episode about cancel culture where, you know, sometimes fans take things too far in the same way that um, some progressives take things too far when they're canceling someone. We also talked about how sometimes canceling is unevenly applied, like when we like a certain person or a certain group. Even if they do something problematic, we're less likely to cancel them. But for others who don't have as big as a following, we don't really talk about them, um, which leads us beyond idols and towards fans a bit more. I'm sorry if this is a generalization, but there is a reputation that K-pop fans are very toxic or often toxic. I'm not really going to say if that's true or if I find that's true because that might be um, problematic for me. I might get canceled also, but... (laughs) I mean, there is that reputation. Like, you can't really deny this. There's even some evidence of fans that, you know, stalk um, their idols or bully their idols or even other fans. So in when those cases happen, I don't think that anybody would say, well, that's okay. It's okay if you threaten other people. What are the barriers to holding fans accountable when they go too far here? Because I think everyone would like people to be held accountable for bad things that they do. What are the barriers to holding them accountable though? I think the first thing that stands in the way is anonymity. Most of these fans make death threats online. So they have accounts where there's no name or... You just can't trace the identity of the person making these comments. 
And so that makes it very difficult to hold them accountable. Additionally, fans are also located all over the world. So, and yeah, so it's very difficult in order to, it's very difficult to make criminal cases, uh, criminal charges against them if they go too far. And then I think that's a third possible reason why we cannot hold fans accountable is because the industry is silent. To be fair, um, agencies are taking strong stances against uh, the bullying or of their own idols. So for example, uh, they would make statements encouraging fans to report individuals who make death threats against the idols that are under their company. However, while they are taking active measures in order to protect their artists, they're not really taking action when these same fans direct hate toward other artists or other fans. So there's kind of a double standard when it comes to these things. So the agency can try to hold these fans accountable. So yeah, they can try, but they cannot always succeed because of these factors. For example, when Nayon from the girl group TWICE had a stalker, her agency was able to file a restraining order and make criminal charges against this person but they can't really do anything beyond that because the stalker is from Germany so while they can try to hold some fans that are really committing crimes accountable it's very difficult because of factors such as anonymity the fact that they're located worldwide and the fact that some cases don't always get reported to the agency themselves so speaking of stalkery fans there seems to be a unwritten rule in the K-pop industry or in the K-pop world where idols are not allowed to date anyone and if they do, they need to keep it a secret. So my question is, since I found this rather strange, why is that the case? Well, as we talked about the concept of Uri earlier, some people feel like they have ownership over these artists. So some imagine them as their future boyfriends or girlfriends, or they also lose their support for a pers- for an idol if they suddenly become uh, if they suddenly get into a relationship. So I remember in I think 2016 when. Taeyeon, the leader of the girl group SNSD, had to apologize to fans in the airport for dating Taekyun, a member of EXO. I don't understand why she had to do it. I don't understand why fans were attacking her because of her dating another idol, but that's the way it was in the K-pop industry in the past. However, uh, right now, I think dating is relatively more acceptable compared to before. So recently, um, it was revealed that Jenny from Blackpink is dating G Dragon from Big Bang. So I'm not, not saying that the fans are more. Uh, there are no toxic fans left. There still are if you if you check social media, but I think it's not as bad as before. And just to clarify, this dating rule, like this rule against dating, is not just an unwritten rule. So there are some agencies that have this rule as part of the contract. So not really sure why that is the case, but maybe it's because idols lose their appeal to fans when they're no longer single. That's why it's kind of a taboo to date in public. However, despite these constraints, there are still some K-pop idols who date publicly. So, like, Baekhyun from EXO. So, I mean, it's not as if fandom energy is all bad, right? Like, we have seen how K-stands help out progressive movements such as Black Lives Matter, even Filipino progressives by hijacking pro-government hashtags. So, actually, the K-pop community, they're partly why Filipino troll farms and disinformation networks haven't been super successful in penetrating Twitter. So what's the deal with that? Are, are K-pop stands just likely, more likely to be progressive? Or like, is there a link or correlation anywhere here? Or is it just something that happens by accident? Yeah, I think it's the latter. Something that happens by accident. I don't think they're inherently progressive because the same fandom, for example, that supported the Black Lives Matter movement is the same fandom that is directing hate, uh, misogyny, and 
homophobia against Lady Gaga, Ariana, and Ariana's brother. So maybe the reason why some of these fandoms supported Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement, is because BTS took an active stance in favor of the BLM. So. Like I guess my I'm just wondering if they didn't would these fans have spoken up? So yeah, that's a question that I have. So it's like sure there are progressive fans, but there are also toxic fans. And where and while one may argue that these toxic fans are only the loud minority, they're a very annoying, very triggering, and very vocal minority. So if you go on Twitter right now, like after the loss of BTS in the Grammys, you have like you have BTS fans attacking Lady Gaga, Ariana, and even Ariana's brother. So and when the fandom is being called out for it, some of them are saying that hey, not all BTS fans are like this. They're just a minority who's like who was just more vocal. On social media, but I think it's the same idea with like hashtag not all men. Like, yeah, not all fans are toxic, but some of them really are, and I think we need to like all we need to call them out, and we need to make sure that the bigger fandom is like has an effective gatekeeping mechanism or something like that. So I guess to just conclude what I've been saying so far, on one hand, they mobilized for. The Black Lives Matter movement, and like they bought tickets to a pro-Trump rally and didn't show up. But on the other hand, they're also toxic against women, against、mm, gay individuals because they're faves. Like because BTS lost, so so it's very interesting to me that you brought up hashtag Not All Men because you could argue that you know in the Not All Men thing that what makes it so problematic is. Even if you are by yourself as an individual, not really toxic、um, as a man, there is still a patriarchy or a system that encourages you to be problematic, you know, or, or to be sexist or misogynist.、Yeah. So I guess my question is: Is the parallelism、um, that applicable? By by this I mean, is there a sort of system in the K-pop community that encourages? Um, these toxic behaviors, or is is it just like similar in this way in how the community has responded, but not really the underlying structures behind、um, why people do toxic things? Well,、hmm. I don't think there is a structure, but I guess it's similar in a way that there's a lack of accountability for prob- like wh- even these individuals engage in problematic behavior. So I think one word from there. Like favorite K-pop idols would have made them not bully other individuals. Like we've seen in BLM, how strong these fandoms can be when they mobilize in support of a progressive cause. So I think that if the K-pop idols are not silent, then we have more chance of making these people listen. Because to be honest, some of these fans only listen to these K-pop groups. So yeah, so I think that makes it very difficult to hold them accountable. Like if you go on Twitter right now after like, the Grammys, I talked about how some fans are like directing hate at Lady Gaga and Ariana. There are fellow fans who like, call out these individuals, and I find interesting the things that they say. So. They would tell these people who are making these attacks that what would the boys say if they find out about this? I think that's very interesting because there's essentially it's just saying that don't do this because the boys would not approve of it. Not don't do this because it's wrong. <laughs> these are human beings. These are fellow artists who also deserve、uh, to be acknowledged for their、uh, work. So yeah, so I think that the lack of accountability also stems in part from the silence of these K-pop idols themselves. Like there's a motion recently.、Uh, there's a motion about this recently in Walsh Pre Asians Debate 2020 last December about whether we should hold. K-pop groups accountable for the behavior of their fandoms, and I think our discussion thus far can help 
uh, you come up with debates. With, we could help you come up with arguments for debates like that. I remember debating in that tournament, and I did encounter that motion. I think we vetoed it because I didn't <laughs> know enough. <laughs> But now, knowing what I do know, I probably would have debated it and would have debated it strongly. So anyway, you mentioned how activism, when it does happen, happens to a significant degree because of the power and strength of the K-pop fans and what they're able to do when they mobilize. So if it does exist, however, it seems to only be based on what idols say, not really because people necessarily believe in these causes. If this were true, I, I guess my two questions would be, why why do people wait to that extent that people have to direct them towards a particular cause? And why is it that celebrities don't actively just tell members what to do or tell their fans what to do in the process? Mm. Well, I think there's a concept I learned about recently about celebrity diplomacy. So, uh, it's, it's a, this is from uh, my one of my IR classes. It's when popular individuals are used in order to bring attention to an issue or to try to influence the public and policymakers to pursue a policy or a course of action. And I think the question of why do we have to wait for them to speak out before we care? Something that I guess is just it's just the same with other parts of our lives. A lot, many of us, unfortunately, are indifferent to some causes. So, and we only started caring about like, and some people only started caring about the environment because their idols are the advocates for like climate change, for ca- combating climate change. So. I guess it's the same. It's the same thing that happens in the, like outside the K-pop world, where we're largely where we where sometimes we don't care about issues unless they directly affect us. And I think additionally, the like yeah, it's unfortunate that some like, fans don't necessarily believe in the progressive cause. So they're just doing this because they're like this is what the K-pop group is saying. So I guess another drawback of this is yes, like which I already mentioned earlier, they support BLM, but also engage in behavior that contradicts what the like, BLM is fighting for because of the hate that they've been giving to women and uh, LGBTQ individuals. So I guess the question this raises is if, for example, Blackpink are not the advocates. Of the UN Climate Change Conference happening this year, would Blinks have cared about the environment? So, yeah, I think that's the question. When, like, sure, these K-pop fans, these K-pop fan, like, sure, these K-pop fandoms can be really powerful when they mobilize for a cause, but they're not inherently progressive. And I guess the harm when K-pop groups always speak out is, what if these K-pop groups are not progressive? What if what they're saying are racist or homophobic or something like that? Uh, so, and these like, fans will be just as easily convinced because it's what, uh, yeah, because, you know, and these fans will be just as easily convinced. So I guess, like I encountered a motion before about whether we should regret the industry-wide silence on social and political issues. So on one hand, they can be very powerful, but on the other hand, these fans, some of these fans are not always critical. So the possible harm of idol speaking out is they can be indoctrinated in ways that might be not what progressives want. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, the contradictions that you find in how people behave here, and the most recent example that you gave was the hate that、um, a lot of fans raise or or launch against、uh, Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, and her brother.、Um, so I guess now would be a very opportune time for us to go to the most recent controversy, which is BTS not winning in the Grammys. And we began this episode by talking about how there there was a motion about boycotting the Grammys. Obviously,、mm-hmm. they didn't end up boycotting the Grammys, but since they didn't win, what do you feel about this? I think to start, I'm not going to defend the Grammys as an institution. I think there are also problems with them. Additionally, 
I think I, I empathize with BTS fans when they said that uh, the BTS has been exploited so that they have been used in order to get views. So even when they were supposed to perform last, like they were being used in the commercials or tweets, etc. since the beginning. So yeah, I can get why fans are really upset that like BTS didn't win. But on the other hand, while I do recognize these problems, I think some fans assume that getting nominated means that their boys need like had to win. So this might be controversial, but if you go on Reddit, on the subreddit, K-pop rants, for example, there are some people who are saying that the behavior of like some BTS fans or some armies is that of entitlement. So just because they got nominated doesn't mean that they deserve to win. I'm not saying that. That is my view. But there are some individuals online who are expressing Uh, these thoughts against like, armies. Additionally, as far as I know, BTS really wanted to win a Grammy award, and understandably, they're upset that they didn't. So I guess that's why uh, the fandom is really taking it hard. But I just don't really agree with how they're expressing their disappointment with the results. But some would argue that being nominated is a victory in itself, right? Um, they, mm. I don't think it's common for K-pop groups to even be nominated for Grammys yeah. in the first place. So why do you think, as you mentioned, there is a, a sort of sadness that overpowers whatever happiness that they should have received from the nomination in it of itself? Well, I think for one, as I stated earlier, uh, BTS really wanted to win and that's why they were really sad that even if they got nominated, uh, they still didn't win the award. But additionally, the loss could also be weaponized against them and Asians as a whole. So for example, Garbage Pale Kids released a comic, uh, it's a whack a mole and what you're going to whack are faces of BTS members. So for some people, the loss of BTS justifies hate crimes, which shouldn't be the case. Okay, I'm going to go beyond the racist aspect here because I don't think that that's debatable anymore. I think that everyone should just yeah. not like racism. Although what is debatable is To what extent we should blame the participation of the Grammys here to that racism. There's also an idea that in live performances or on commercial, they sometimes find it very hard to reach the notes. So some people say that actually the agency is the one that manufactures the songs. So I guess here we can talk about the industry. Is that true? Like to what extent do groups or idols actually make their content Um, and to what extent is it just, you know, going through a factory, just making the most formulaic stuff for mass consumption? To what extent is that true? Hmm. Actually, a lot of K-pop groups don't make their own songs. So only a few self-produce and some get involved in the production process. But in the most part, like, their producers write the song, uh, their dances are choreographed by professional choreographers. And they're just really there to perform. So, like an issue, for example, with Twice in one of their in some of their live performances, which you can like see in YouTube, they were not able to reach the notes of their most recent songs. And many fans have been coming to their defense by saying that it's not their fault. It's just that the lines that they were given were decided by like. JYP Entertainment. So, for example, those whose strength lies in rapping were forced to sing in a very high pitch. So, some fans are saying that we couldn't blame the girls, rather we should blame the agency for forcing them to do what it's not really their strength. So, yeah, and additionally, aside from not being able to reach notes while performing live. Um, some idols right now no longer sing live. Like, yeah, there's a pandemic that's going on. But if you watch like, Inkigayo or other music shows, 
you can hear fake breathing in order to, like, I don't know, give the impression that the idols were singing live. But they're really not. It's really obvious that it was pre like pre recorded and they're just there to perform. I don't know why agencies are doing this. But they are doing it more recently. It's like I guess it's a way of controlling the situation and preventing, uh, preventing idols from messing up and potentially ruining their image. And then a third uh, possible effect of um, these, a possible effect of K-pop groups not being able to produce their own songs is a lot of fans feel that their songs become inauthentic because they're not the ones who wrote it. For example, a K-pop group called ITZY has a song called Wannabe. So the concept is about self-love, but some fans don't like the song because it was not written by members of the group. It was written by uh, like the agency itself and they just needed to sing it. That's why they don't feel like it is authentic. And then I guess a fourth impact of not being involved in the production processes just have no choice about um, when you're going to be able to have to, when you're going to be able to release a new album. So for example, like, I know some fans of Blackpink who are disappointed because even because one of the members, Rose, like had her solo debut recently, but there were only two songs. And additionally, the uh, like one of those songs has already been performed by Rose in a previous concert, if I'm not mistaken. So like, the songs they have are very few because from what I know, the one who produces the songs of Blackpink is also the producer of other K-pop groups. So that's why um, their artistry, to some extent, can also be limited because of how the age, like because of how the industry operates. But K-pop, you really can't deny that it's such a huge deal now. Um, and some people even go as far as to saying it's a new source of soft power for South Korea. So, what do you think about this, especially as a political science major? You talk about power. You talk about like politics, like this. What do you think about this? Do you agree it's soft power? Give me the IR stuff because I don't, I don't really know. Well, for one, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I'm still an undergraduate student, so there's that. But I think a, a concept, a misconception that is easy to fall into if you read the news, which I think many debaters do, is that foreign journalists tend to exaggerate the role that the South Korean government played when it comes to like expanding the K-pop industry. So I'm going to like, uh, I think a resource that you can look into if you're interested is the forum entitled Korea Landed on You. So it's a forum by UP Korea Research Center. And in it, some scholars say that the K-pop industry is largely a private venture. So it was developed by the big three, namely um, like JYP Entertainment, SM Entertainment, and YG Entertainment. And more recently, Big Hit Entertainment, the home of BTS, is also becoming like, stronger economically so while the k-pop in this so while k-pop has increased south korea's soft power i don't think it's deliberately manufactured by the south korean government or i don't think the Kore south korean government has direct control over the k-pop industry because it's largely a private venture mm. They tried to impose a top-down approach. So, for example, previous conservative governments in South Korea uh, tried to use the Hallyu, way, the Hallyu or the Korean way for political purposes, but they didn't really succeed. So, I guess we, I guess it's fair to say that the South Korean government can be. Um, exploiting the popularity of K-pop, but I don't think I, mean, I don't think it is justified to say that um, the K-pop is successful because of the South Korean government. So it's largely because of the efforts of musicians, 
producers and just individuals who wanted to become idols. So I guess soft power is about influencing, right? And mm-hmm. a lot of times or recently, we've been seeing a lot of copycat groups emerging in other countries. What are your thoughts on them? Mm-hmm. Uh, earlier, I brought up the forum Korea landed on you. So one, there's a discussion there about whether the Hallyu or Korean wave is a form of cultural exchange or cultural imperialism. So, and I think one of the interesting answers, they said that, well, while it has been uneven so far, so mostly the Philippines has been consuming Korean cultural products and not really sending Filipino cultural products to South Korea, I think it's also changing as a result of these quote-unquote copycat groups. So for example, there's a group called SB19. They are trained by South Korean choreographers, but they're Filipinos. And their music has reached South Korea and not just the Philippines. One can argue that consuming Korean cultural products does not mean losing one's Filipino identity. As long as we try to even out the cultural exchange that has been happening thus far. We can learn from them as long as we also don't lose sight of what makes us Filipinos. I think that's where I stand. I guess in terms of imperialism, maybe there's a debate there about how it's imperialism against us as Filipinos, but there's also a debate about westernization of South Korean culture as well. And you see a lot of collaborations with Western artists, you see English versions of K-pop songs. There's also the idea that the reason why it's so popular is it takes a lot from Western music. And I think you said that earlier that it's Mm -hmm. actually, it gets a lot from hip-hop as well. But the difference is at least the way K-pop uses it, it's kind of innocent and clean and pure as opposed to Western hip-hop, which is about drugs and sex and violence and stuff. Do you think that this is westernization? Like, is this the West trying to co-op K-pop? Or is this K-pop taking things from the West and making it their own? And if there is westernization, what's the harm there? I think it depends on the way you look at it. So some are saying, uh, some don't like the songs of Blackpink because they're mostly written in English. But you hear Blinks saying that, what's wrong with that? These K-pop idols uh, grew up in English-speaking countries, like some of them. Therefore, they're more comfortable singing the English language. So it's not really because they want to sound more Western. Maybe it's just what they're comfortable with. Um, but there, yeah, there are other like parts that are really appealing to a Western audience. So, for example, when they perform in the U.S., so they sing the English version of their Korean songs. So, yeah, I guess depending on how you look at it, the extent of westernization varies, but it is happening. So, if there is indeed westernization, like a westernization of the Hallyu or the Korean wave, possible harms include losing one's, like losing the Koreanness of K pop groups. So, earlier I talked about how. Uh, consuming Korean products might lead us to lose or forget our Filipino identity. And I think the same like, logic applies in this case. So by going global, they have to appeal to a larger audience, which is not necessary, which is not really accepting of Asian cultures. So maybe you can argue that the harm of Westernization is your uh, by appealing to them, you have to sacrifice parts of your culture that they don't really feel they that, that um, global audiences don't really find appealing. But on the flip side, we can say that Westernization does not necessarily mean um, losing what makes them South Korean or what makes them Asian. So maybe Westernization just means that their target audience is the West. And even if they don't speak in English, you would still have, um, they would still have international fans who love them for who they are, for their Korean songs. And yeah, and not necessarily because they're now speaking in English. So for example, even when 
uh, BTS released their first English song, which I think everyone knows by now, Dynamite. Uh, some fans are saying that they really they don't like Dynamite as much as they like other songs of BTS. So yeah, it's written in English. Yeah, it's very popular. But uh, in but the beat like BTS members were not as involved in the production of Dynamite as they were in some of their other songs, which some fans feel um uh, yeah uh, are not as involved in the production of their other songs so one can argue that even without speaking in english or collaborating with western artists they're not going to lose fans because these fans just support them because of other reasons yeah thank you so much again for agreeing to be part of this episode we know that you in particular don't like being recorded for anything so we're very <laughs> honored that this is the first time you let yourself be recorded mm-hmm. um okay, it's for nina and kyle oh, oh, oh thanks <laughs> thank you <laughs> actually this episode has been in the works for a month actually like we, we started planning this a month in advance and we only got to record now after the whole grammys issue we were just mm-hmm. like this is the perfect time actually to talk about yeah. um this episode yeah. so that's it for this episode thank you all for listening we'll see you in the next one Bye-bye. bye bye thank you bye bye